Well, hello everyone. I'm Carl V. Hill, Chief Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Officer with the Alzheimer's Association. Welcome to the Dr. James S. S. Jackson Seminar on Health Equity and Alzheimer's Disease hosted by Dr. Peter Lichtenberg of the Michigan Center for Urban African-American Aging Research and the Gerontolo Gerontological Society of America and Jennifer Leppard, Executive of the Alzheimer's Association's Michigan chapter. We are thrilled about today's discussion and grateful that you all decided to join us for the event. As it is named for a champion in the aging, gerontology, psychology, social psychology, and public health fields, we look to honor the memory of Dr. James S. Jackson by showcasing research from multiple disciplines, multiple perspectives, and multiple career stages that is not only inclusive and diverse, but intentional in the pursuit of health equity for Alzheimer's and other dementia for all communities in ways that Dr. Jackson might appreciate. With non-white racial ethnic groups being at higher risk to have dementia, this type of discussion is critical and timely. And given that the Alzheimer's Association just yesterday reported in our facts and figures uh, report that today there are 6.2 million older adults living with Alzheimer's, but by 2050, that number is expected to jump to nearly 13 million people. In that report, uh, it, it was found that discrimination is a significant barrier to Alzheimer's and dementia care among Asian, Black, Hispanic, and Native Americans. In that report, it was also found that more than one third of Black Americans and a fifth of Hispanic and Asian Americans believe that discrimination, racial discrimination, would be a barrier to receiving Alzheimer's care. Last, and I think really most importantly, half of Black Americans and Native Americans report that they have actually experienced racial discrimination in the healthcare system. With also with a third of Asian Americans and Hispanic Americans also reporting that they too have experienced racial discrimination when seeking healthcare. These numbers are alarming uh, and because we all are aware of the, the, the influence of structural racism and how it patterns people's access to resources, quality healthcare, but even when we are able to get people to the healthcare system, non-white racial ethnic populations have experienced discrimination and believe that it would be a barrier to receiving the quality care that they deserve and that they're paying for. This could be a, a very important reason why non-white racial ethnic populations are less likely to receive a timely dementia diagnosis. This is a definite call to action. And one of those calls should be to the hotline for including more health equity and health disparities researchers to help identify and understand factors that create and sustain disparities in Alzheimer's and other dementia, namely structural racism and experiences of interpersonal racial discrimination. We are honored to have several of these researchers with us today. And so first we'll start off and hear from Dr. Kathy Wright, Assistant Professor, the College of Nursing at Ohio State University. Dr. Wright. Thank you so much, Dr. Hill. And I am so incredibly grateful to be here today. And like many of you, I have my own personal story to share in regards to my interactions with our dear Dr. James Jackson. He was actually uh, on a R01 submission, my very first as a postdoc, and he didn't know me from anyone, but he was so gracious and, and helped me with that process. Um, unfortunately, it didn't get funded, but um, I'm so grateful for that, as well as I'm grateful for his help in regards to a manuscript that I had published 
uh, last year that looked at uh, racial discrimination and neural processing in African Americans. So I'm eternally grateful for him and for all the work that he has done uh, to forward this cause. And we at The Ohio State University at our Alzheimer's Center of Research Excellence, we are looking at trying to leverage all of these things and really looking at how we can translate research to practice and how we can build more robust teams that involve uh, multiple disciplines and multiple ethnic backgrounds. So I'd like to start with a story. And the picture that you see right here, this is of a very young me many years ago, um, my husband and my parents, my mother and father, uh, Maxie Miller and Roberta Miller. Uh, the reason why I have this picture up here is because my father, unfortunately, passed away of complications due to Alzheimer's disease. But before he passed away, my mother died um, of a sudden massive heart attack. And caregiving really can cause tremendous stress on an individual. And I firmly believe that her role as a caregiver led to many of her physical complications despite all of us trying to help take care of my father. Both my mother and father had hypertension and they were both from the deep south, probably had a fourth grade education, seventh grade education at the most between the two of them. And this is what sparked my interest, my experiences in life, as well as having been mentored by Dr. Jackson as why I have chosen to look at chronic stress in particular as a potential mechanism that we can address for the treatment and prevention of Alzheimer's disease. And as has been mentioned, um, African-Americans are twice as likely to develop Alzheimer's disease. And I feel that that uh, can be contributed to uh, ethnic racial discrimination and stress that we've experienced over the years. And I know that the development of Alzheimer's disease is certainly a very complex, uh, multi-component disorder that we are addressing. However, I think there is a lot of room left for us to really recognize and treat chronic stress as one of these factors. So for Older adults, and the reason I have the title of the slide as old stress and why do we care is because this is what someone asked me one time when I began my journey at looking at chronic stress in older adults. They're old, they're stressed, why do we care? Well, the reason why we care is that for older adults, managing chronic conditions is a number one stressor, as well as family relationship stress. And even in my own research, I found that um, African-American older adults are so concerned about the uh, spiritual well-being of their children and their grandchildren that even that in and of itself causes them great stress. And African-Americans who perceive that stress is a cause of their um, hypertension can sometimes take a more fatalistic approach to it being that, well, if it's stress, there's nothing I can do about the stress. So why do I bother to work with fixing my hypertension or making changes? And in a very, very um, seminal article that Dr. James Jackson had written in 2010, he actually looked at uh, brain processing in our stress uh, center, the HPA access is what they call it, and that unhealthy behaviors appeared to be protective for African-Americans. However, um, engaging in these unhealthy behaviors is what is contributing to many of our health disparities and our mortality and morbidity too. So when it comes to disparities within the realm of chronic stress, uh, there's been wonderful work that has been done by uh, Megan Zordolf and Rachel Whitmer in this space. And they looked at the experiences that African-Americans have and 60% um, or over 60% of African-Americans have more stressful events than non-Hispanic whites. And so what those stressful events are, uh, issues with housing insecurity, dealing with racial and ethnic discrimination, as well as looking at this sort of intricate 
um, uh, co-informed um, issue of hypertension and stress. And there was a huge study done with the Jackson Heart uh, data that looked at predicting hypertension four years out in African-Americans and that 52% of those who um, experienced discrimination stress developed hypertension. And even in my own work, as I mentioned, and this is the manuscript that uh, Dr. Jackson had reviewed for me before I had gotten it published, that we actually looked at neural processing in the brain using functional imaging, and in particular, the emotion processing areas of the brain uh, were dampened somewhat by having the experience of racial discrimination. And when we look at chronic stress and cognition and why this is such a problem is that we know that from at least um, animal models and mouse models that uh, there does appear to be some linkages between chronic stress and um, looking at particular areas of the brain, as well as looking at elevations in cortisol, which is a hormone that's associated with stress and that there may be a pathway there that leads to the development of Alzheimer's disease. Now, when we're looking at chronic stress experiences that African-Americans have, the interpersonal conflicts, financial insecurity, dealing with multiple serious health events, and we know that in the advent of COVID-19, that that has been a huge lens and mirror upon the United States as to these discrimination practices, as well as health disparities. Events of serious illnesses, we're more likely to have multiple chronic conditions, past trauma and psychological trauma. And where this becomes significant is that um, in some of the work that has been conducted that each stressful event, and that means if I have interpersonal conflict and financial insecurity, that equals four years each of cognitive aging. So if I have two of these things and I've aged myself cognitively by eight years, but I don't wanna just present a picture of doom and gloom in this space because there are many things that we can do. There is a window of opportunity here. And by providing equal access to culturally informed self-care interventions, we can reduce some of the prevalence of Alzheimer's disease. In fact, if we were to just simply um, reduce or delay the onset of Alzheimer's disease by five years on average, we could decrease the prevalence of Alzheimer's disease by 45%. So welcome to the beehive. So this is the name of my um, lab, as I call it. It's not a lab with mice and microscopes, but it's more or less a lab that's uh, conducted out in the community. And it's brain and blood pressure health in valuable elders. And our tagline is that we're saving brains one blood pressure at a time. And in our recent publication that we had in the uh, Journal of the American Geriatric Society, we tested one of these interventions. Uh, it was an intervention of mindfulness and emotion that was developed by one of my colleagues, Dr. Mariana Clapp. And we tailored it um, and developed also a very culturally informed version of the DASH diet or dietary approaches to hypertension, which was developed by another colleague of mine, Dr. Ingrid Adams. And so we had individuals go through this intervention as compared to an attention control group that was just more of a social group that learned non-hypertension um, education things such as uh, fire safety, medication safety, et cetera. And so the long and the short of the story is that um, even though it was a very small sample because it was a pilot study, uh, it was certainly feasible among these African-American older adults that had mild cognitive impairment based on our attendance rates, as well as we did notice some uh, clinically significant differences in blood pressure between the attention control group and the mindfulness and motion plus the dietary approaches to stop hypertension. So as I mentioned, um, my work does not just include older African-Americans, but we're also looking at health across the lifespan. So I'm really excited about 
a new study that we're embarking upon um, in April that was funded by the Ohio State University Racial Justice Seed Grant Fund. And it is stress and emotion management for Black and African American women with hypertension in a COVID-19 social distancing society. We know that uncontrolled uh, blood pressure in middle ages, especially in women, is very predictive of cognitive decline in the future. So some of our markers that we're looking at aside from stress is that we're also doing extensive um, neurocognitive testing remotely with these women as well. So to conclude, I'd like to um, give us a charge. Our charge is that we would educate because we know that what's good for the heart is good for the brain based upon a lot of the hypertension studies that have come out recently, in particular, the Sprint Mind trial. We know that if we can keep blood pressure at a normal rate that we could reduce cognitive decline by 30%. Uh, we need to collaborate with individuals, communities, and organizations, as well as disseminate all this wonderful evidence-based research and programs. So I'd like to thank the funders of this research, um, as well as my amazing, fabulous interprofessional team for, with which I could do nothing. And I would like to turn this over now uh, to Dr. Bernard Shrews. Uh, he's going to talk about health inequality, contributes to cognitive impairment and dementia, the case for West Virginia. Thank you. I'm sorry, we've got an issue here. I'll get to you in just a second. There we go. My apologies. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Bernie Shrews. And um, growing up in Sydney, Australia, it wasn't exactly uh, West Virginia that was the first thing on my mind. But um, going to a John Denver concert, actually, in Sydney in 1977, I first heard about uh, Almost Heaven. West Virginia, and you may know the song as Country Roads. Little did I know then that um, I would ever visit West Virginia, let alone move here and spend 20 years of my life <clears throat> loving West Virginia and being married to a fourth generation West Virginian. And so it's almost heaven to many people, but not to everybody because there are places in West Virginia where the coal has played out, coal mines have been abandoned, where there is excessive amount of pollution, where along the Kanawha River and the Ohio River abandoned chemical plants are leaking into the water. And for many people then, the situation isn't exactly heaven. The unofficial motto of West Virginia is wild and wonderful. And that's certainly true for young people who come and enjoy whitewater rafting, as you see here. They enjoy hiking, uh, mountain climbing, um, but they also tend to leave, as do uh, lots of the people in West Virginia who seek opportunities elsewhere, which leaves a large number of people in West Virginia who are older. And if we know anything at all about dementia, one of the greatest risk factors for Alzheimer's or a related dementia is age. One in 10 people contract Alzheimer's disease by the time they're 65. But that increases to one in three by the time they're 85. And West Virginia is among the oldest of the states in the union. And we really don't have any idea. We have estimates, which I'll talk about in a minute, but we really don't have ideas about how many people there are in West Virginia. So let's have a look at dementia in West Virginia and what do we know? We have a population, it's a small population, um, about 1.8 million people. Almost 21% of those are over age 65. So we have almost 370,000 people 
who are over age 65. And as I said, because age is such a risk factor, the likelihood of dementia increases. The Alzheimer's Association currently estimates there are between 38 and 40,000 people. But what we've done is looked at the Medicare data that's available, claimant data, and it's a fairly good proxy of, of what's going on in the state because 96 to 97% of, of people uh, are Medicare claimants. And with 12.1% of those people having a diagnosis or being treated for Alzheimer's disease, we're close to 44,500 people who may have Alzheimer's. But we really think this may well be the tip of the iceberg because at least in West Virginia, not a lot of people see their doctor routinely. And even if they do, the visit may be for five or 10 minutes to get a prescription renewed. And uh, many do not rise to the level of a cognitive assessment or are diagnosed. Added to that, we have health inequalities as health inequities in West Virginia. <clears throat> Some of the inequalities are shown on this screen. The mortality rate in West Virginia is higher than the national average. As I said, nearly 21% of people are over age 65, which puts us second or third in the country in terms of the age of the population. Surprisingly, over 60% of West Virginians live in rural areas. In fact, West Virginia is the only state that's completely within Appalachia. Sadly, 16% of these people live in poverty and their socioeconomic conditions are, are terrible. Of those people eligible to, to work or capable of working, only 54% are gainfully employed. Perhaps most importantly for Alzheimer's disease, 23% of West Virginians who are over age 65 have six or more comorbid conditions, comorbid with dementia. In many places, medical access is limited. Yes, we have major hospitals in uh, Morgantown and in uh, Charleston, but the truth of the matter is for routine medical care, it's rather difficult. I had a former student who's a, a nurse practitioner who says she is the only source of routine medical care in the county. And of course, with state budgets continually being impacted, we have limited state resources to address some of these inequalities. But what about health inequities? Uh, what's unfair about health in West Virginia? Well, as I've said, there's limited availability and the quality of local health care. Surprisingly, even though we have mountains and rivers, there's inadequate drinking water. Some of the counties are still on a bottled water regime. Pollution and air quality is, is bad. We have a lot of industry and a lot of mining. Surprisingly, health food is, healthy food is scarce. People living in rural areas don't often have access to healthy food. And those choices are hard to find or they're expensive because unhealthy choices are more popular, they're more plentiful, and they're less expensive. And we know that all of these sorts of lifestyle factors are really important risk factors for dementia. If you wanted to live a healthy lifestyle, many people have no facilities to do that, no gyms and no access to very safe outdoor spaces. In fact, probably the healthiest people in many towns in West Virginia are the football team and the basketball team. There's also a cultural bias to uh, running around in gym shorts and, 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 and gym shoes. Um, and then lower educational attainment. West Virginia ranks last in the number of people with a college degree. In part, that's because blue collar jobs used to pay very well. The mines paid well but with those extractive industries reducing and essentially being eliminated, jobs are also being eliminated. And because of that level of poverty, money for college is not always available. Bringing all those things together, health inequalities and health inequities, 
we see that heart disease in West Virginia is higher than the national average. Diabetes is higher than the national average. I've circled West Virginia in each of these maps. Hypertension, high blood pressure, I've already talked about that from Dr. Wright. That is crucial and you can see that the, uh, the, the hypertension follows the Appalachian chain. And we have obesity higher in West Virginia than many other states. In fact, the unofficial motto of West Virginia is often thank heavens for Mississippi because all these health indicators are actually second or worst relative to, to uh, Mississippi. In fact, here I've got a table just to show you the sorts of chronic conditions that we know uh, are higher in West Virginia than the US national average. Everything in pink there, it's worse in West Virginia. And I've highlighted several of these in yellow because each of these, diabetes, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, and heart disease are all risk factors for Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. Epidemiologists have shown that with just one of these risk factors, the likelihood of dementia increases by about 23%. Sadly, all of these risk factors sum, and they sum geometrically, so that someone with four of these chronic conditions has a tremendously elevated risk of dementia. And as I said in a previous slide, many West Virginians have six or more of these risk factors, and so the likelihood of dementia in West Virginia is actually higher than the national average. So what are we doing about this? As Dr. Wright said, we don't want to be all doom and gloom. And one of the things that we've developed is a population-based registry to try and account for what we think is just the tip of the iceberg. We want to see what's underneath there. Um, and this Alzheimer's disease registry is a passive registry. We request information from a number of different sources. And we hope that we can collect this information about Alzheimer's and related dementias so that we can start to inform stakeholders. The Alzheimer's Association West Virginia chapter that I want to give a shout out to is an integral partner in trying to understand the complexity and the, the level of problems here in West Virginia. This Alzheimer's disease registry is one of only three in the country. It's based on a wonderful um, registry in South Carolina, the Arnold School of Public Health, and one that was recently launched in Georgia. And together we have a consortium, we get together and we try and understand what some of these numbers are telling us. We uh, extract information from Medicare files, we receive uh, electronic health records from the hospitals. We can access and, and collaborate with physicians. And we also get reporting from nursing homes. And together, these data are allowing us to start to form a picture of what's happening in West Virginia. And in this map, you can see just raw numbers of cases of Alzheimer's disease. These are some older data, but you can see that there are many, many red, red spots there, especially in the South where where the mining industry is, is, is very heavily um, impacted by this loss of mines, by this loss of employment, by these risk factors that have all increased dramatically over the last few years. But again, not wishing to be totally a downer on, on this, I wanna talk a little bit about West Virginia University and the Rockefeller Neuroscience Institute, which you can see here lit up purple last September in recognition of, of National Alzheimer's Month. And when we spoke to the executive chair, Dr. Ali Razai, and talked about the challenges of Alzheimer's disease, one of the issues was that people who are referred for a, a workup, an assessment of, of cognitive impairment, may have to wait up to six months before they can get an appointment. And Dr. Rezai said, that, that's, that's just not acceptable. And so the uh, Rockefeller Neuroscience Institute launched a memory clinic in which we now receive referrals from across the state and from the Alzheimer's Association. And we're able to see people more routinely, give them a workup, tell them about uh, clinical trials, connect them with the Alzheimer's Association if they haven't, if they don't know about that. And then 
to be even more futuristic, the Rockefeller Neuroscience Institute recently started one of the very first clinical trials to assess the efficacy of a special treatment of focused ultrasound, which temporarily opens the blood brain barrier. And in the middle of the picture sitting in the, in, in the chair there is Judy Pollack, who was a, a NICU nurse at WVU. And, and she's uh, been very outspoken and is very happy to have her name uh, broadcast. And, and she was one of the first patients who was uh, treated with this focused ultrasound. You can see it, it takes a big team to do this sort of research and these clinical trials are still ongoing and they will for some time in the future. These, these are things that are not necessarily available for everyone, but they are research projects which tell us more about what's going on in the brain and whether or not we can actually treat people and try and remove some of these uh, beta amyloid plaques that we know are a part of Alzheimer's disease. So in sum, uh, although West Virginia is challenged, we have a very poor old population that are disproportionately underrepresented uh, at, at the national level. We do have reason for hope and um, we're encouraged that moving into the future, we'll be able to eventually beat this disease which devastates so many people. And with that, I would uh, like to introduce Dr. Irving Vega from Michigan State University, who's going to talk about Alzheimer's disease and COVID-19, the vicious cycle of inequality. Thank you very much. Uh, it is an honor for me to be presenting in a seminar series named after Dr. James S. Jackson. Dr. Jackson uh, dedicated his career to uh, lay, uh, lay down the path toward health equity. And today my presentation actually uh, is a call for action. It is time for us to move to that path that Dr. Jackson laid for us and reach that goal of health equity. Uh, before I continue, there is no financial conflict of interest that I would like to declare. As my, my colleagues have previously indicated, the social context, that, those contextual factors due to a stress, due to rural uh, environment, to poverty, those are pressures that we know, as again, as was presented before, that led, lead to poor health outcomes. Those health out, poor health, health outcomes have a direct impact in performance in education due to uh, issues with attendance, lack of concentration, and increased learning disabilities. Poor performance in education then brings people back to uh, contextual factors to places where the choices of healthy limit, li living are limited, where lim there's limited access to uh, quality of care, uh, healthcare, which then brings back and increase that uh, poor uh, health outcomes in what I call the vicious cycle of inequality, which has been described again by the previous presenters. This vicious cycle of inequality uh, leads also to the accumulation of diseases that we know are risk factors of Alzheimer's disease, as it was shown in West, uh, West Virginia. But the limited choices that people have within those contextual factors and the aspect of society, the stress that we saw on the streets last year uh, in big cities or small cities, at the border in the South, and we recently see due to COVID-19 pandemic at the hospitals. All that together in that context that people are living uh, also increase risk behaviors. And those risk behavior lead to increased alcohol consumption and smoking. And the limited choices also led to, leads to unhealthy diet, which increases the probability of uh, a comor uh, chronic diseases or metabolic disorders, such as diabetes, obesity, hyperlipidemia, that leads to hypertension. 
as it was shown in the previous presentation, all these chronic diseases are directly associated with increased risk of Alzheimer's disease and related dementia in underserved, as particularly underserved community and underrepresented ethnic groups. In the case of uh, African-American Latinos in comparison to, uh, to whites, I would like to bring to your attention this meta-analysis that look at uh, studies of prevalence of Alzheimer's disease. And in, uh, when you look at the average of all the studies, it confirms that Blacks and Latinos here in green has a, a higher prevalence than whites. But I wanted to bring, I want to bring to your attention that the variability among these studies in terms of the level of prevalence of Alzheimer's disease. And that is due to the context and the cohort, the definitions of the cohorts that were underlying those studies. In this case, I wanna make the case that uh, the context where people live, that contextual factors, those social uh, forces that affects underserved communities and underrepresented ethnic groups contribute to that higher risk and that higher prevalence of Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. In an example, I wanna bring to uh, your attention the Caribbean Hispanics that is form of Puerto Ricans, Dominicans and Cubans. When I was at the University of Puerto Rico, I collaborated with the Penn Memory Center, uh, and specifically with Dr. Steve Arnold. And uh, they were looking at a cohort of, of people living in West Philly. And we decided to compare uh, Blacks, Latinos, and whites in terms of their profile of Alzheimer's disease. What we found was that the Latino cohort which actually was formed of 85% of Puerto Ricans, their age of onset of Alzheimer's disease for the Latino cohort was significantly younger than blacks and whites. And when you look at the cognitive uh, score, uh, the, the cognitive score was lower, significantly lower in the Latino cohort in compared to blacks and whites. And when you look at, uh, at education, the education also was significantly lower, the years of education in the Latino cohort compared to blacks and uh, uh, whites. This study led to the conclusion that the Latino cohort in West Philly has a more dramatic and more severe symptomatology associated to Alzheimer's disease, probably lead to uh, based on or associated with uh, the, the education and socioeconomical factors. Since at that time I was at the University of Puerto Rico, I decided to test this, this conclusion by doing a retrospective study in Puerto Rico and look at the Alzheimer patients, uh, people that were diagnosed with Alzheimer disease in Puerto Rico and do a profile similar to what we did with the uh, Latino cohort in West Philly. What we found was that the age at diagnosis of the, of the age at, at onset was significantly different from the ones reported in the Puerto Ricans in West Philly. In Puerto Rico was actually similar or even higher than whites in West Philly. When you look at education, the education also was higher in comparison to the education of the Puerto Ricans living in West Philly. And when you look at cognitive score at diagnosis was four to five points higher than the, uh, the cognitive score reported in the, in the Puerto Ricans in West Philly. So the context was the only difference. Puerto Ricans living in, in West Philly versus Puerto Rican living in Puerto Rico. As part of now in Michigan State University and part of the Michigan Center for Contextual Factors in Alzheimer's Disease, which actually is a center that conducts a, a summer data immersion program. I was part of a group interested in understand migration and the impact of migration to cognitive function. And in this study that came out of that summer data immersion program led by uh, Mark Garcia and Wasim Taraf, 
the team actually look at the uh, national represented data in the uh, health and retirement study and look at, com at the comparison of, of cognitive function at baseline between whites, non-Latinos whites, US born Latinos and Latinos that migrated when they were younger than 18 years, when they, that they migrated between the ages of 18 and 34 years of age, or that they migrated to the US uh, 35 years of older. And I wanted to bring you to the, your attention to the, di the blue diamond, which is the data adjusted by age, sex, and education. And what you can see is that the US born Lati Latinos has have a, a worse score in, in cognition, a cognitive score than the whites, than the non-Latinos whites. But when you compare that to the Latinos that migrated to the United States, regardless of the age when they migrated, their cognitive score is similar to whites or even slightly better than whites where the US born uh, Latinos have a worse cognitive uh, score at baseline. And that is true regardless of the cognitive, do cognitive domain that we look at. So the context, the, Jew, the Latinos that are US born actually have a, a worse cognitive score at baseline than those Latinos that migrated uh, to the United States. So this is, again, bring the attention to the context, to those social determinants of health, to that contextual factor that, that serve and feed into poor health outcomes, which lead to poor performance in education and that vicious cycle of inequality that in the COVID-19 pandemic, we, see, we saw how actually uh, serve as a fertile ground for including to bringing up a new health disparity, which is COVID-19. In Michigan, we saw how the west part of the state, most blacks were affected. And in the east part of, uh, I'm sorry, the east was the, the, Afri the blacks. And in the west side of the state was the Latinos. At the national level was the same thing. Uh, blacks and Latinos was more affected than whites. And when you look at hosp hospitalization and death rate, definitely, all these social determinants of health and all these inequalities serve again, I want to mention, serve as a fertile ground for COVID-19 to, to go into another health disparity affecting four times or more uh, Blacks and Latinos compared to whites. The problem with this is that COVID-19 will become uh, potentially a new risk factor for Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. We know that the neuronal manifestation associated with COVID-19 are real. Yes, there are ongoing studies to determine and the debate about whether it's direct impact or indirect impact. Indirect impact look to the effect in the cerebrovasculature affecting oxygenation of the brain or direct effect by affecting directly the neurons and, and actually there are reports that when they look at uh, broth samples the markers of brain injury uh, that are detected in a COVID-19 patient are similar to someone that suffered a traumatic brain injury. So definitely COVID-19 is affecting the brain. And in the future, we will see that COVID-19 may become an Alzheimer's disease uh, and related dementia risk factor. And we know why it's affecting more Blacks and Latinos. We know that it's that institutional racism that drove uh, that health disparity associated with COVID-19. We know that that is what is contributing to that high increase in cases and death among Latinos and Black. And we know what we need to do. We need to work toward uh, resolving those disparities to break that uh, vicious cycle of inequality. And by doing that, it has been reported many times that we can prevent or delay at least half of the dementia cases. So we need to start asking the right questions in order to move to that path that Dr. Jackson laid out for us toward equity. We usually see these pictures where we try to exemplify equity and we get distracted and ask the wrong questions because we think that the problem in this uh, picture is the fence 
that is a, affecting the view of these two subjects. And by the, taking that defense is actually the problem. We may be able, we might actually create new buyers because these two wooden boxes are actually taller than this poor guy. So how this guy got on top of it is actually these two wood boxes represent a new barrier. This guy probably needed help to get in there. So by asking the wrong question, we actually will be, a, will be creating new barriers. And the question here, exemplifying this example that we need to ask is why these three guys are behind the fence and not sitting here at the bleachers, at the, at the benches where everyone else, because the path to equity is actually through inclusion. We have to work through inclusion to get to that health equity. And to give us an example of how we can go that, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Sharia Robinson Lane, who is the next talk is gonna talk about culturally responsive caregiver support, developing interventions uh, for everyone. Dr. Robinson Lane. Thank you. It's my pleasure to um, be a part of this um, panel. I've really enjoyed it. And I, every time I hear you guys speak, I swear I learned some um, new things here. Um, and so I'm really going to focus on a little bit of a different um, aspect today, and that's the uh, caregiver. And particularly, how do we develop um, interventions that are culturally responsive to support um, caregivers, because we know that dementia is a, um, a family concern, right? It doesn't just affect one individual, but it affects all of the other folks that love on that individual and um, are engaged with them. And so my work um, today is um, has been funded by a variety of um, organizations, including the Michigan Center for Urban African American Aging Research, really um, kicked off a lot of my work. And it's been my pleasure to be engaged with um, that Rickmar for many, many years, both as a doctoral student um, and um, later as faculty. And like many of you, my uh, dementia story is very personal. Um, both my maternal and paternal grandmothers died of dementia, um, one of Alzheimer's disease and the other of um, Parkinson's. And so this is something that's very, again, personal and something that um, I think drives uh, the um, need to find some interventions quickly and things that work for all of us and not um, for most of us. And so we know when we talk about dementia family caregiving that it is associated with the most negative health outcomes compared to uh, other forms of um, caregiving. Um, and when we look at the particular types of care that people are providing um, through uh, this sort of support, um, we can look at it through instrumental activities of daily living, as well as activities of daily living. The instrumental activities of daily living are things that um, a lot of people don't really think about um, until you are, as I call it, voluntold to provide uh, support. Things like helping somebody to make telephone calls, taking them shopping, um, being able to um, get their transportation um, situated, paying bills at home, preparing meals for themselves, and even being able to manage what sometimes is multiple medications. The activities of daily living are the things that more of us um, that aren't actively involved in caregiving tend to think about um, when it comes to caregiving work are more the physical activities that are necessary, like being able to get in and out of bed, getting dressed, using the toilet, and just um, general personal care and grooming that individuals need assistance with as their um, disease progresses. And so when you think about dealing with all of these sorts of care, one of the um, projects that I'm currently involved in is a, um, a national um, caregiver study that is really assessing the needs um, and ways in which Black caregivers in particular are engaged in um, caregiving and the sorts of uh, supports they're utilizing and how the ways that they cope influence their caregiving practices. And uh, so far, uh, we've done some preliminary analysis and have found that interestingly between these two groups, the instrumental activities of daily living and the activities of daily living, it's those instrumental activities of daily living that are really creating a large impact on individuals and affecting their stress um, that is influencing alcohol use, 
Um, and um, the longer that individuals provide care and move into these uh, needed to support individuals activities of daily living, they begin to develop some coping skills um, by that time. And so it's really critical that um, that means that earlier interventions um, for caregivers are really necessary to support people in dealing with some of um, what mo many people might think about these small things like uh, um, where wandering might fill in or and where it might be presumed that less support is needed. And that's actually where more support is needed in these earlier stages. And one of the things that really makes uh, uh, this challenging for family caregivers is stress, right? Um, being able to not have a break, doing this sort of work day in and uh, day out um, can really be stressful to the caregiver. And for many caregivers, particularly those that um, are of non-white backgrounds, there's really a lot of um, cultural influence in the way that you can talk about caregiver burden. So you often don't get the opportunity to complain, if you will, about um, the things that are um, happening or how you're feeling about it, you just have to deal with it, which can increase the level of stress that individuals um, have to manage. And so we know that um, one of the things that influences our stress response, so the way that when we respond to stress, we respond behaviorally, we do some things different as a result of um, stress, and that's influenced by culture. And so uh, there's a lot of different um, definitions of culture out there, but one of the ones I think I would um, like for you to take home is this idea that culture is just the learned patterns of behavior um, that we all have that teach us how to survive in the world. Our first cultural group is our family. Um, and culture is influenced by all of the things that you see here, um, shared histories, our traditions, um, the society um, that is around us, our ethnicity, our beliefs, our religion, the neighborhoods. As we grow older, our friends, the places we work, our education level, all of these things influence our behavior. And the challenge that we have, particularly as healthcare providers and researchers, is thinking about how do we integrate these important aspects of culture into the work that we do so that we are highlighting the value of the individual contributions that people have to their own health. And the problem is that when we don't engage in culturally responsive care, we end up with health disparities that we've um, talked about in some of the presentations um, preceding. And so we know that health disparities really are preventable, key word there being preventable differences in disease, burden, injury, or violence. And it's often influenced by that underlying factor of um, institutional racism, which influences the um, individual's access to care, um, their um, treatment responses, as well as how disease, particularly um, various forms of dementia, may progress amongst groups. Amongst Black family caregivers, there is a particular concern because they are more likely to be engaged in what we call high intensity care. And so when we go back and look at those um, activities of daily living and those instrumental activities in daily living, they're doing just about everything on each of those lists rather than a few things here and there. And as we said before, they're not getting a break. And so that high intensity care, of course, is going to come with much more higher levels of stress. There's long care trajectories because we know that there's this paradox where um, Black older adults in particular um, begin to outlive their white counterparts after the age of 85. And so individuals that may have um, conditions like dementia may otherwise be um, healthy. So of my grandmother's, my um, grandmother previously, she lived until she was 98 with uh, dementia. So you can imagine the care trajectory in which we um, needed to engage with her uh, more carefully from the age of around 92 all the way until you know 98 and the different sorts of transitions that were necessary for us to be able to maintain her care at home for as long as possible. Um, as a result of this increased stress, and we know caregivers have an increased likelihood of poor health, having lower income, as well as having future dementia diagnosis themselves and uh, premature uh, death. Um, caregivers aren't very good about utilizing support services for a variety of reasons. Um, some of it has to do with geographical constraints. In the past, more of the programs required a membership of being a, a part of a particular health organization or having a specific diagnosis to be able to access services. And then they just really weren't culturally responsive in, um, in the design of the program. 
Um, and so people did not um, feel as though the materials sometimes were uh, geared towards them. You know, it's hard to want to be engaged when something as simple as you get materials and you never see yourself or your family um, in the materials that you're receiving. Some of the health concerns that caregivers have based on the um, work that we've done um, so far is that there's a large incidence of obesity with 90% of caregivers experiencing obesity, um, uh, high levels of hypertension, um, as well as diabetes, which we know all of these are risk factors for those caregivers to develop a future dementia related diagnosis. And as Dr. Vega pointed out earlier with these, um, with COVID, this is affecting um, caregivers because when we look, the vast majority of hospitalizations of um, individuals have been amongst non-white groups. Um, and when we look at the mortality, the 50 to 64 range is pretty high there. That's your average age of your family caregiver. So we haven't even begun to fully understand the effects of COVID on um, dementia care, not just in terms of how it affects risk for people who have survived COVID, but what does this mean for our system um, and how it may be now influenced by these caregivers who are no longer um, with us or who now have um, exacerbated concerns perhaps related to um, COVID. We also know that social isolation is particularly problematic um, now um, as hopefully we're nearing the end of this pandemic. And so again, those who are most at risk for social isolation and loneliness are people, single women, people with fewer uh, social contacts, those with worsening health, um, low income and limited education, which also frequently describes our family caregivers. And so um, we want to think about interventions that um, are engaging to people as well, where um, we're providing tools, but we're also providing an additional layer of support where people are able to connect socially with one another. Part of this work means being culturally um, congruent in what we're doing. Um, and there's four key concepts to cultural um, congruency, which it starts with appreciation um, and acknowledging the values that individuals have. Um, adjusting care and adjusting what we're doing um, as much as possible so we're accommodating. When we can't accommodate uh, families, we want to be able to explain why we can't accommodate them. And then finally, you want to um, negotiate um, as necessary so that we're still able to maintain high standards in whatever our practice areas are. When individuals um, want to get support, um, support is available um, through the county. Um, it often varies. Unfortunately, a lot of families are not aware of the programs that are available in their local areas and really have a challenge um, trying to connect with support. Um, part of that challenge is there's a disconnect in the early stages of disease where the person affected by dementia um, often does not want their family engaged or may um, be a bit secretive about their diagnosis and how it's progressing, the family is noticing, and they're trying to get help and provide support, but really are at a loss of how to engage, how to keep their loved one um, safe, and then being able to effectively plan. Um, so some of the key resources, of course, are the Alzheimer's Association, um, uh, first and foremost, um, and being able to help individuals uh, find information on understanding what is um, happening and what to expect. I mean, there's lots of resources on the website. Um, the area agencies on aging can help people to connect with local resources in their area. Um, centers, um, senior centers, as well as houses of worship often have um, programming for um, seniors, as well as um, support for uh, caregivers. Um, it's important to think about using low levels of technology in order to stay connected. And then a key thing that people really, um, I want to stress uh, for uh, diverse caregivers is really talking with people about the importance of completing advanced directives um, so that that's one less thing for the family to have to really um, worry about and making sure that that individual um, gets their um, needs uh, met. Again, with our culturally responsive protocols, we want to, um, particularly in research, we, it's good to engage focus groups prior to study implementation to get feedback um, to make sure that what we've come up with is something that's going to be acceptable with the group. Um, think about with our teams, the difference between what we think is a population fact and really evaluate that for bias. And sometimes it becomes easy for those things to kind of get interchanged. And so that's where the focus groups can also come in to help with some of that. And then really think about targeted recruitment strategies. 
Um, with my team, we've done uh, um, targeted Facebook marketing as well as some um, very specific marketing. Um, and so we recruited, for example, about 60 caregivers. We had over 200 impressions um, in a matter of about seven weeks um, for uh, some of the work that we're doing. And so it really does make a difference to have targeted recruitment strategies. And then think about managing hard to reach populations with things like having multiple phone numbers to contact um, people and things like that. Um, some of the findings that we've had is that spirituality, past experiences and how um, and information gathering is really important to diverse caregivers. Um, and so thinking about um, how can we implement these things into our interventions as we uh, move forward. And then again, with recruitment, thinking about a variety of ways of recruiting individuals, um, utilizing the places where people go, whether it's sororities and fraternities, church health ministries, um, community education events once we're back up and um, working together, and then, of course, Facebook um, advertising. So for me, the next steps are really investigating the relationships between health and adaptive coping strategies. Um, I'm looking at um, developing an app further along to provide a tool for caregivers to be able to connect uh, with one another, and then, of course, developing community-informed um, interventions. So I'm very grateful to um, a team of folks that um, have been very engaged in this work and keeps things uh, moving along. And uh, we're going to move into our Q&A session. And I'm happy to bring back uh, Jennifer Leppard from the Alzheimer's Association. Thank you everyone so much. I learned so much in these presentations today and they have generated some great questions. So I'm gonna start off by going right back to Dr. Robinson Lane. Um, a question came in that said, should bio so psychosocial be factors be assessed along with the neurological aspects of dementia? I think that that's particularly important to do so. I mean, some of the work that's been done has found that there's a relationship between, for example, education um, and cognition. And sometimes it can appear mm -hmm. as though um, a person has worse cognitive decline where it really just um, has to do with their education um, level. Um, and so I think that that's really important to gather um, that uh, data, particularly for um, if we are looking at um, um, longitudinal um, information about disease progression and things like that. Uh, Dr. Schurz, do you want to add anything to that question? Yes, I do, actually. Uh, education is really a, a, a tremendous uh, issue when it comes to dementia. <clears throat> we know that um, the, the less education there is, the, the less cognitive reserve, the idea that as you get more and more education, the more and more pathways are formed and different pathways can connect to uh, information that uh, one pathway may be blocked and another may, may, uh, may provide that access. The less education you have, the less uh, cognitive reserve. I think that's the term we use. Thank you. Um, I'm going to post this one to Dr. Wright to start, but um, if anybody else wants to jump in, can you discuss patients' awareness in the early stages in relation to memory, social functioning, and um, activities of daily living? And do psychosocial and social factors account for an extensive amount of variance between this level of awareness? Yeah, so in relation to awareness of dementia, and this is an area that I particularly study, but I know from my many years of clinical experience that traditionally uh, persons who have earlier signs of dementia may have uh, symptoms of depression um, before they actually exhibit uh, clear signs of dementia. People who are more socially isolated or not engaged with others um, may show signs a little bit earlier in that uh, space as well. And I'll let some of my uh, panel presenters answer the rest. Yeah, does anybody else want to address that question? Well, I think that um, it, it, I agree with Dr. Wright that um, people are generally aware of um, their change in um, cognition. And I think that one of the things that is helpful that I've seen some insurance agencies um, do, and I can't remember there's one in particular, is they have been thinking ahead 
um, because they have the data and how people are accessing the healthcare system and using some predictive models to identify um, who's going to need a caregiver. And so they've actually been being proactive about um, calling people and identifying um, caregivers. Now, I don't know the script that they're using in the particular language of how they're engaging um, that, but I think that that's really important. And that's an important thing for other organizations to maybe think about, um, including um, primary care physicians, is how do we um, encourage um, individuals who are uh, managing um, dementia and cognitive loss to engage loved ones in the care and engage in it early and thinking about how to do this in a way that um, doesn't instill fear. And the biggest fear that individuals have, older adults in general, not just people with dementia, is a loss of independence. And so if we can be upfront about that, then I think that it takes away a lot of the barriers and fear that people have around um, telling people, you know, and being secretive about um, having changes in cognition. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Hill, we had a, oh, Dr. Scherr, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say that um, some of the things that, ha that happen when, when patients present um, they, they are very good at um, hiding some of these cognitive deficits. Mm -hmm. And in a very brief uh, visit with their PCP, their primary care physician, um, the issue of cognitive impairment may not rise to the level of detection. And we, we think about people who have subjective cognitive impairment, those people who are aware of that, and they, they seem to transition into mild cognitive impairment and, and dementia um, quite, quite readily. So that it's, it's very important that um, we have cognitive assessments, say, for example, as part of the annual wellness visit, which is uh, 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 reimbursed by, by Medicare. And we, we need to encourage physicians to do those cognitive screens, but also be aware that people are very good at hiding some of those cognitive impairments. Thank you. Um, Dr. Hill, we had a couple of questions that came in specifically about research. Um, one of them was, can you give us some examples of clinical trials? But then also a question related to somebody who would like to participate in clinical trials, but they're actually worried that it might um, set them up to be denied insurance in the future if it's in their record that they have dementia. Can you talk about the, both of those issues a little bit? Yeah, I can uh, definitely talk about how to participate uh, in the clinical trial. We've got a really great resource uh, with the Alzheimer's Association uh, called Trial Match. Uh, you can access it at uh, uh, alz.org backslash trial match and a great, a great uh, way to, to, to receive a customized list of clinical trials that may be in your area. Uh, or a loved one or you know, care partner, and, and certainly healthy volunteers can participate in, in ALZ.org uh, backslash trial match. So wonderful resource there. Um, but we do know that people are less likely to just sign up for a trial, right? So we know that there are, there, there are real issues as it relates to engagement and trust. Trust, less than 5% of clinical trial participants are um, non-white, uh, from non-white racial ethnic population. So we've got some work to do. I think there are the, the barriers, uh, uh, per, you know, really relate to a, a lack of engagement that seeks to build trust and awareness and education about Alzheimer's and, and dementia, um, but some barriers as they relate um, to to uh, to health insurance and, and, um, and, and certainly not being able to access those important resources, you know, so all of that, I think, you know, speaks to a need to uh, to to really develop and and help to cultivate this this science of uh, uh, engagement or 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 recruitment, so that we can understand, you know, what some of these uh, factors that serve as barriers at several levels, you know, so at the at the interpersonal where people just don't trust participating, but there's some other you know factors that might relate to transportation, you know, how to participate, time of day that that people are asking, uh, you know, our uh, you know, people in our communities to, to, to come in and participate in the clinical trial. All of that, I think, you know, links to, to help to, to a need to better understand uh, many of those issues, uh, Jennifer. Thank you. Um, Dr. Vega, we'll start with you on this one. Um, so we've talked a lot about barriers. We've talked a lot about communities of color and a question came in, how do we encourage communities of color to go to their doctor to get diagnosed earlier and more accurately? Mm -hmm. 
that was to me. Or? Yes, we're going to yeah. start with you on that. <clears throat> okay, so I think uh, going to what Dr. Hill was talking about, understanding what are those barriers from the perspective of the healthcare providers. Uh, because sometimes we engage in trying to uh, educate without self-education. So uh, we move into, again, what I was saying, they're asking the wrong questions. So we need to go into, into a retrospect analysis and then decide within the healthcare systems, what are the implicit, institutional implicit biases that are the barriers that affect that approach from the, from the community before we try to educate the community in things that, that, uh, that they, they look at it and it might not be a problem. It's actually the trust, is actually how accessible it is, is, is actually how we, we can see in the Latino community, for example, that there are barriers in language and how those, those uh, resources are available at the front door uh, for those people to, to feel included in the process. So I think we need the healthcare system to move from the current and traditional system of we are here, you come to us, and the reason why you're not coming to us is because you're not well educated about the healthcare. And, and think about how the healthcare, the healthcare system can change that and bring the point of care closer to the community and with, with faces that are similar and, and are uh, and approaches that are taking in consideration the cultural aspect of that community, the needs of that community. Uh, uh, because we, if not, we are trying to provide, uh, trying to do the same thing, expecting a different result. <laughs> and we are not changing. Uh, we, have to, we have to start doing things different, especially that's what COVID-19 uh, is, is, is teaching us. We have to bring the point of care closer to the community so that the community are stronger when crises like this happen. Um, there's another question that came in that's really related that I'm going to throw to Dr. Hill to start if he's game. Um, so we know that we have to take into consideration um, the psychosocial factors that we've talked about. Um, but one of the questions that came up is that we have a dearth of practitioners to address the needs of underrepresented communities. Can you speak to how we address the need for providers if we solve the problems to patients getting to a doctor, where is the provider that's going to meet those needs? Yeah, really good, good, uh, good, good question, Jennifer. And you know, you know, really linked to the facts and figures report that that highlighted the, you know, the the impact of racial discrimination in the healthcare system. I, I tell you, two important things, and maybe three are you know relevant here. One is you know cultural competence for healthcare providers, and that's for everyone uh, to be competent. Uh, and aware, and and maybe not just competent, but accountable. You know, so standards uh, in training for dementia specialists, gerontologists, those that see, um, you know, individuals from diverse communities. You know, what does what does assurance, you know, look like from a culturally competent perspective, and being sure that that uh, when uh, you know we're a caregiver or we, we're seeking care, that we're directing people. Who have had that training, that that have that you know assurance to provide comp culturally competent and aware care, right? So I, I think that's a huge opportunity for this space. Um, also, increasing diversity within the healthcare system, you know. So that I think you know really links into building pipelines to all of the the wonderful institutions, training institutions, medical schools in this country that that champion diversity. So there are. There are uh, uh, medical schools that are historically black colleges and, colleges and universities, Hispanic serving institutions. How can we best strengthen that pipeline of a uh, clinician that is able to provide the care to, to our loved ones in our communities? That's, that's, that's so important. And then third, I think it's partnerships. You know, So the Alzheimer's Association has, has uh, recently uh, partnered with the Thurgood Marshall College uh, Fund uh, so that we can better engage uh, these historically black colleges and universities in hopes in hope that we can can uh, work with a Howard University or uh, you know a, a Charles Drew 
uh, you know, medical school in Los Angeles to, again, you know, be, you know begin to, to include these diverse clinicians uh, into, into the work that we know that needs to be done, you know. So cultural competence, diversity, Jen, Jennifer, and then partnerships at the national and, and community levels. Thank you. Um, Dr. Wright, a question came in during your presentation, specifically um, asking for some more clarification. When you define a stressful experience, how do you define that, seeing that challenging situations are inevitable for all of us? Is, the, is it the experience or the response that dictates the negative outcome? That's an excellent question. And when you look at, <clears throat> excuse me, experiences of stress, you know, the study that I was referencing in particular, they were looking at even childhood experiences in relation to, you know, did you grow up in an environment where there's alcohol abuse, drug abuse? Um, have you experienced death recently, loss of job, et cetera? And, you know, you're right, we cannot avoid having the stressful experiences in life. And that it's sort of twofold though. We have the experience, our body physiologically reacts to the experience. And then where the problem occurs is that if these chronically stressful experiences that we have uh, come in sequence repeatedly, um, then something happens, which is called um, allostatic load, which is kind of the wear and tear on the body because of chronic stress. So then that is unhealthy mm -hmm. and detrimental uh, to us. And also we know that we can modify uh, some of these things by our responses to stress, by using mindfulness meditation um, in a constant standard practice of that. Uh, but you are right on both uh, points in that, yes, we have the stressful experience, it affects our bodies, but we also have ways in which we can try to modify that. And that's on the individual basis. But you also have to look at it from a societal and community basis as well, because we know that um, underrepresented individuals tend to be under-resourced in terms of what they have to help reduce the stress. So I think that we have to also look at it from a community support um, and environmental perspective as well. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Schurz, we had a question that came in about the Alzheimer's registry that you talked about in West Virginia and why don't they exist in more states and what are the advantages? Um, I, th I think there's been a tremendous uh, push for Alzheimer's patient-based registries. And nearly every state has those for people who are, are interested in, in participating in research and some of the most courageous people who are, are actually interested in donating their bodies at the, at, and on their demise because we need to know much more about the brain. But a population-based registry is, is different. And, and that, that I think, has to do with a lot of different factors. You know, as all the panelists know, there, there's still a lot of stigma associated with uh, a, a diagnosis of dementia. Getting a di diagnosis of dementia is difficult. And the, our Medicare data show that, that we just probably touching the tip of the iceberg. And these sorts of registries need, need to be passive. We don't want them to be converted into recruitment registries. So there's a difference between a population-based and a patient-based registry. I think it's an, an issue of will in terms of, of getting this uh, into other states. The South Carolina registry, for example, is a voluntary registry. The uh, registry in, um, in West Virginia is uh, required by state law, as is the case in Georgia. The advantages then, to answer the second part of your question, is that it provides information, it provides resources, it connects people to resources, and it provides information to the stakeholders, not just the patients who need as much information as they can, but the caregivers, the, the physicians, uh, local communities, uh, county level uh, health organizations, as well as state-based organizations that, that need this information. How many nursing homes are we gonna need? If we've, we, we believe the numbers, and I think we should believe the numbers of the dramatic increase 
in the number of people who are going to suffer from Alzheimer's or a related dementia, then the infrastructure is just not there. We don't have the nursing homes. We don't have the specialty uh, facilities that we don't have the, the physicians. We just talked about um, we, we need more physicians. And, and, and one of the things we need to do is to incentivize uh, medical schools and physicians to train more geriatricians and to train more uh, PCPs who will go, for example, into West Virginia to rural areas. Part of the requirement of medical school at WVU, West Virginia University, is that they spend a semester or more in a rural community. All of those issues, all of that information could come from a registry. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Vega, we had some questions that came in specifically about your research, um, whether or not you've broken down the groups that you're looking at um, as specific as Cubans versus Puerto Ricans versus Mexicans versus South Americans. Um, and also, how did you decide on the age grouping of 18 to 35 as the relevant age for later impact? Yeah, thank you for that question. It, it brings actually some of the limitations of using databases, uh, large databases and longitudinal studies like the HRS. So actually the, the first question about the age group mm -hmm. was following previous studies that look at those uh, divisions, but actually it's a study of exposure because the HRS start uh, recruiting people in their 50s and 60s and early 70s. So it's a health and retirement study. Uh, so it, it looks at the exposure. So there is a limitation in terms of the amount of people that were in the longitudinal, that continue in the longitudinal study. To us to maintain power, we have to be careful in how we do uh, the, the distributions of the group. Because if we continue going into a small details, we lose the amount of power that we can ach to achieve any significant results. So that's the limitation. And we discussed that in the paper. Uh, and that goes also to the different subgroups among the Latinos. So we, didn't, we were not able to divide it into, into Mexican, Puerto Ricans, which actually are the major group component of the Latinos, and then divided then in more into Cubans or Domin Domin uh, Dominicans is actually makes even, even more complicated with that set of data. However, we, we know uh, outside uh, work of this work that their comparison between uh, Caribbean Hispanics in the Northeast, is particularly in New York versus Mexican in the West side. And there, there's strict differences between the group in terms of the progression of the disease, in terms of how uh, is, is the, the cognitive performance of each group. So there are distinct uh, differences between Caribbean Hispanics and Mexicans. Uh, so there is interesting to find out why, what are these, these differences? Um, uh, and, and also when you look at immigration as exposure and we look at Puerto Ricans, Puerto Ricans are distinct because they don't go to the same process of immigration that other Latin groups. Uh, Puerto Ricans, or since birth, they are US citizens. So they don't go to the true, to the complete immigration process like the Dominicans and the Cubans. And uh, there are stories that have been done and published in Cuba about their Alzheimer's disease and what they do. Um, but the, the stories of Cubans and Dominicans as a group has been limited. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we have come to the end of our Q&A time. Um, this hour and a half flew by for me. I wanna thank all the um, presenters again, but I wanna turn it over to Dr. Hill for some closing comments. Oh, tremendous, Jennifer, this was great. You know, just great discussion. Thanks to, to Dr. Reich, uh, Schurz, Robertson Lane, Vega for discussing um, their important work uh, in this area. You know, discussions around lifestyle and culture all in the context of um, uh, what I think social and environmental factors that are fundamental to the disparities in Alzheimer's and dementia that we ob observe. So, you know, multiple pers perspectives all really focused on factors that are upstream, you know, that shape behavior you know, for most people long before any amyloid or tau accumulates, uh, you know, in the brain. So, you know, say it plainly, to reduce risk for dementia, we must start assessing the social determinants of health, which may be fundamental for those 
uh, most at risk, right? So, you know, and that's when non-white racial ethnic populations are included in Alzheimer's research, you know? So, you know, if you think about the findings uh, from the Alzheimer's Association Facts and Figures special report, the people most at risk are rarely included in the studies. And when they are recruited to a healthcare system, they are treated unfairly because of their race or ethnicity, right? So it's important that we, uh, we continue uh, this, this discussion. It's, it's so critical and so important. And um, there, there's a, we're excited to hold a health disparities conference, research conference. I don't know if that slide is gonna make it, make, make it up, but uh, we'll share some information I about. So. Okay, yeah. here we go, here we go, yeah. <laughs> so you know, it will be held virtually. Uh, June 14th through, through 16th, and we'll, we'll try to invite the speakers that were here today and many others, but we'll continue this, this discussion, which I think is going to be uh, critical uh, for us to understand uh, the course of Alzheimer's and other dementia in all people, and, and, and you know, really most importantly, those that are disproportionately affected. So thanks again to, to our hosts, um, our presenting researchers, researchers, and of course, uh, all of you that took the time to participate and listen in to, and to be a part of this, uh, this was just a tremendous, tremendous event and, and opportunity. And so on behalf of Dr. Lichtenberg and uh, Jennifer Leppard, we thank you all for participating and, and hope that this is, you know, yet another start, you know, in our effort to include more perspectives, more factors over and beyond individual level determinants for for health uh, and, and health disparities. So thank you all for participating and, and have a good evening. And if you have any questions about Alzheimer's or anything that we've discussed, my uh, colleagues are available 24 seven, 800 272-3900. There's a wealth of information on our website. You can see that report on racial discrimination in the healthcare system uh, for those seeking Alzheimer's and dementia care at alz.org backslash facts. And my colleague, Jean Barnes is always available to her email address and, and phone numbers there. Thank you all for participating. Have a good evening. And we will be sending a recording of this out tomorrow um, as a follow-up. So please uh, look for that. And if you have any questions specific about the presentation, please reach out to Jean at her email or phone number that are on there. And we can also connect you with any of the researchers if you have specific questions. So thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Hill. Thank you.
Thank you.